Uh, welcome to our introduction of Electric Imp. I'm Josh Michalayo, <clears throat> Product Manager at DigiKey. Uh, at DigiKey, we've seen tremendous growth in wireless products and capabilities with the advent of uh, smart devices, better technologies, and the higher integration of software and hardware. Uh, we see the term IoT, or Internet of Things, being used. <clears throat> excuse me a lot to describe the connection of many objects wirelessly and over the internet. That's why today we are very excited to give you an overview of Electric Imp and their innovative Imp modules and services that provide a simple, <coughs> cost-effective way to add connectivity to your application and the end-to-end -end solution to connect your device to services and apps. Uh, today we're lucky to have uh, Matt, Hugo, and Peter from Electric Imp to give us the introduction and answer any questions that come up. While you're watching, if you have any questions, please tweet them using the hashtag DKIMPHOA, and we'll have a short Q&A after the presentation. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Matt's presentation. All right, thanks, guys. Thanks. Um, so we're going to go over uh, just sort of a, a few basics of the Electric Amp services and hardware. Um, and then we're going to do a, a real quick demo where we'll give you guys uh, a URL and you'll actually be able to control a, a little RGB LED um, just from your browser. So uh, we're Electric Imp. Um, we're all about making it really easy to bring uh, internet connectivity to your hardware projects. Um, so anybody who's sort of uh, tried building connected devices has probably run into um, a lot of pain points. Everything from hooking up all of the, the Wi-Fi hardware that you need or the wireless hardware, um, integrating it with whatever other platform you're using, and then ultimately getting it online through the firewall securely and easily. Um, so what Electric Imp has done is tried to build a hardware and software platform that work together to make it as easy as possible to build connected solutions um, and sort of take away all of the pain points of the connected bits so that you can focus on the actual product itself. So um, the solution consists of uh, a few different pieces. One of them is the, uh, the IMP module itself, or the IMP card. Um, so this is the piece of hardware that you're going to integrate into your solution. Um, it involves a 32-bit processor, a Broadcom Wi-Fi chip, um, and then some memory for you to run your code in. And it's designed uh, with a OS that we've written on board, um, and that abstracts all of the difficult parts of connecting it. Once it's connected to our cloud, um, you have access to um, a concept called an agent. So an agent is a bit of code that you can write that runs on our servers, and it acts as a gateway to the rest of, uh, to the, rest of the web. So using agents, you can process uh, HTTP requests, you can make requests going out, and using this, uh, you can connect it to um, you know, servers that you write, you can connect it to third-party services like Twitter um, or Twilio or Google searches, you can write mobile apps where you can focus on the UI instead of all of the messy bits because you can just communicate with a REST API, um, and then you can also integrate it with some other services that we provide. So we have a console that makes it easy for managing um, all of your different tools. Um, we have a IDE, which lets you actually program it. And then you have some other services that will sort of get you going. In terms of the hardware itself, um, we have two different form factors right now. We have a removable IMP card. Um, so this has six GPIO pins. Um, all of those can do uh, digital in and out, PWM. Um, there's a couple analog input and output ports, and then they can do SPI, UART, and I2C. So most of the, the communication channels that you're going to be wanting. Um, and then we also have a solder down module for slightly more permanent solutions. Um, it has a few more pins, um, but everything else about it is basically the same. Um, one of the really nice things about the IMP is in terms of building commercial products, uh, if you're using the IMP card, um, because it's a, a removable piece, all of the FCC and other wireless um, certifications that you need to pass are already taken care of via the card, so you don't need to go through that process. 
Um, and so one of the other big problems that Electric Imp sets out to solve is actually getting your device connected to the internet. Um, lots of people have tried doing this in different ways. Um, some solutions are really easy, some are a bit more complicated. Uh, the process that we've decided to take is something called Blink Up. So this is a process where using an app on a mobile phone or a mobile device, um, you enter your Wi-Fi credentials and some account information, and then using, uh, basically, blinking the screen really, really quickly, uh, we transmit the data to the end using a photo... Uh, Sorry, we transmit the information to the IMP, um, and that has everything it needs to get online and everything it needs to get connected to our cloud services. So as soon as you're done the blink up process, uh, you can start working with your IMP in our IDE. The IDE itself um, is broken up into uh, a couple different uh, windows. So you can write code for the agent, which runs on our cloud. You can write code uh, for the device, which runs on the device itself. Um, and all of this is programmed uh, through a web-based IDE and sent to the IMP over Wi-Fi. So you don't need to worry about programming it using JTAG headers or um, hooking it up via USB and installing drivers. Everything's taken care of through the, through the IDE. So we're going to uh, go do a real quick example with this LED. Um, we're going to take a look at what it takes to uh, sort of get something online, get an LED blinking. Um, and hopefully this will sort of give you guys an idea of what the code looks like. So over here, as you can see, um, we have two different windows. We have the agent code and the device code. Um, and over, over here, uh, we have our actual hardware. So we have uh, an April breakout board. Um, which is just sort of a, a basic breakout board for the IMP card with some power management and the pins broken out. We have the actual IMP card itself, and then we just have a fairly basic RGB LED with some resistors, um, and we've got it hooked up to three different pins. So we're going to start with the, the device code. So for the device code, um, all we're doing up here is basically some configuration stuff. So we've set it up so that we have three pins. They're all going to be PWM outputs. Um, and then we have a really simple function where uh, we take in RGB colors, and then we write them out to the pins, just doing a little bit of math. The sort of funky piece that we have is down at the bottom, um, agent.on. So this basically allows us to capture a message from the agent um, the squirrel code that's running in the cloud and act on the device on it. So when we get the set RGB message, uh, we're just going to call our set function and change the colors. So that's all there is for the hardware code. Um, if we wanted to run this offline, we would be able to, um, but right now it's going to be fairly boring because it depends on messages coming from the cloud. Our agent code is a little bit more complex, but not a lot. Um, we create an HTTP handler function, which is going to handle all of the HTTP requests made to a specific endpoint. Um, all we're going to do in it is make sure that the request is valid. So we're going to check that certain parameters were passed in um, and that they're within our range of 0 to 255. So we define that later on. And then we're going to basically just uh, build this simple object with R, G, and B and then send a message to the device. So this is the same message that we had over on the device side. And so when we send that message, it's actually going to set the color. Um, and then just for good practice, uh, whenever you make a request to a web page, you expect some kind of a response. Um, so that's what we're doing here. We're sending a response back to say everything worked. Um, if there was a problem with the request, we're able to send back a different message. And if for some reason we ran into an error, uh, we'll just return what that error was. So uh, we are going to uh, send out a URL. Um, Josh, what's going to be the best way to do this? <laughs> well, you're muted. I think we'll we'll tweet that out, Matt. Okay, so uh, I'll post it in uh, in the chat, and then you guys can tweet it out. 
Okay, so uh, I have a couple of them to set up here. So uh, we get this uh, agent URL, um, this part, and so each device has a unique URL that you can write um, basically APIs for. And in our code, uh, we set it up so that we're looking at three query parameters, red, green, and blue, and we're expecting them to be between uh, 0 and 255. So if we hit this endpoint, uh, you can see the LED turns on, and it's pretty responsive from when we, we actually go to the page. Um, and so if we want to turn it off, we just send zeros for all of those. So uh, that link's going to get tweeted. Um, anybody who's watching, uh, you can go and you can play around with those values. Uh, you should see the, the LED changing. Um, and you should be able to sort of set it to a color you want and hopefully not too many requests come in and you'll actually get to see your color for more than a few seconds. So just one thing, um, we noticed that there was the, the, the actual last DigiKey tweet, uh, the link for the on-air goes to only to a page which says um, starting soon, yeah. um, which makes it a little hard to get to. I just, I, I just tweeted out the correct link. So I don't know if anyone has been online. OK. Well, I guess um, we'll find out. We're still <laughs> starting soon. So, uh, so we, we tweeted out the correct link without, without the last bit on the end. Um, but uh, oh, did you do that? That was me. No, <laughs> oh, a nice clip. <laughs> so I guess um, at this point, we'll open it up to questions from uh, DigiKey, if you have any, um, and questions from Twitter, if any have been posted. Uh, yeah, one one here, Matt. Uh, have someone asking what kind of security is available on the IMP? Um, I'm going to let you answer that one, Hugo, because you can probably go in a lot more depth than I can. OK, the, the IMP itself, um, as at a Wi-Fi level, it supports uh, WEP, WPA, WPA2. So you know all the standard general home stuff. It doesn't support 802.1x as yet, um, so not corporate Wi-Fi. But uh, generally, all the home Wi-Fi. Um, it also can be set up using WPS and WPS PIN if your router has WPS functions. Uh, that's just the wireless security. On top of that, the IMP itself, the communications to the server, are secured with TLS encryption. So that's basically the same thing that um, HTTPS uses. So uh, we have two layers of encryption. There's the standard wireless encryption, and then there's end-to-end -end encryption which protects against all sorts of things like man-in-the-middle attacks, um, you know, uh, spoof servers, all bits and pieces like that. So it's, it's, uh, we believe it's pretty secure. Oh, and then data to and from the server going into, you know, out to other devices uh, uses HTTPS. So you can secure your requests and then they'll be secure from the IMP server to your product as well. One thing that's worth mentioning in regards to security too is for an end uh, application, uh, the fact that you can push a firmware update and fix bugs is uh, for end products is a really good feature for security. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another one that we have here is uh, where did the name Electric Imp come from? <laughs> I know this one now. Okay. Um, so IMP comes from a very, very uh, old computer um, or processor called for the Internet Messaging uh, Processor. Interface Message Processor. Interface Message <laughs> Processor. So, so back in history, the, the original ARPANET was built with uh, the computers that connected to ARPANET didn't connect directly because there was such a wide variety of mini computers and mainframes attached. Uh, and so what every computer did had a, a networking processor that did all the networking protocols for it. And those were called the interface message processor, uh, which people shortened to IMP. Uh, and these were big 19-inch racks about 7 or 8 feet tall uh, with a Honeywell microcomputer. And they were made by BBN in the 60s. And basically, they did the internet. Uh, there's a picture now. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah 8 feet tall looks like. Um, uh, and uh, the imp itself is much more powerful than these. <laughs> but, you know, that shows you what 40 years will do. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, that's, that's where the, the name comes from. Um, it comes from, you know, this, the, the electric imp is designed to connect things to the Internet, just like the first imp was designed to connect things to the Internet. 
Okay, and another one here is uh, how much code space is available for my application? Yeah, so uh, that was actually one of the things in our tech sheet, uh, which it looks like I closed. Um, so there's about 128k. 128k of, of bytecode space for your program. Uh, and then in terms of RAM space, it's around 70 kilobytes of RAM space. Then the agent, too. Uh, and then that's in the device. Then the agent has about a megabyte of, of workspace and similar amounts of code space. So you know when you fire up something, you don't need to do HTTP processing down in the the the, the, the resource constrained device in the field. Uh, you know for power reasons and everything, that's that's not such a good idea. So you can do all your HTTP parsing up in something with a megabyte of memory, and then let the uh, the embedded device do what it needs to do. But you know it's it's actually a, a pretty good um, amount of memory for an embedded device. Uh, you know. Sort of 70, 80k is is pretty nice. Obviously, stuff gets used up by your program and classes you create, and data objects you create, and 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 TCP buffers and so on. But that's the actual memory generally available apart from the OS. Our OS obviously has some stuff as well that it takes, but that's not not out of your your code space. Okay, and uh, one last one is, since these are Wi-Fi devices, what kind of bandwidth impact would they have on a network? So bandwidth impact, so I mean, one of the things to, to bear in mind is this is a BGN Wi-Fi. So we support 11N. So uh, we support actually up to 65 megabits air rate. Um, it being 11N means there are various Wi-Fi optimizations above and beyond what 802.11b and g have, and if you have an 802.11b module on a network and it's the only b thing on the network, it means the whole network has to slow down for certain supervisory frames, which means that can take more bandwidth. Um, the, so the imp plays just like any other 802.11n device would on a network, which means you can use all the latest, um, all the optimizations there were to the 802.11air protocol uh, for, for extra speed and bandwidth utilization. Uh, but generally, you know, the imp doesn't talk a lot. Um, you're not going to notice really any network speed impacts. Uh, uh, you know, we, the imp is not designed for high bandwidth applications, but it won't slow down other people doing high bandwidth on the same network. It's it's a very good citizen in, in that sense. Okay. Uh, and kind of to get people started, uh, can you mention a little bit about your wiki and and maybe show that page? Sure. Um, so we have uh, various resources to help people get started. Uh, let me just pull up some links. So uh, we'll get you guys to tweet some links maybe. Um, but we have fairly active uh, community forums that are really good for asking questions and getting started. And we also have uh, a fairly big wiki uh, with lots of information. So I will pull that up. Um, so we have a we have a dev wiki. Um, this is sort of the main page. Uh, we have a getting started guide. Um, it talks about the different hardware. Um, it goes through the process of commissioning or blinking up your imps, um, and then it also has a full API spec for all of the all of the different um, classes and functionality that's available, um, as well as you know you can get spec sheets for the imps from here, um, as well as uh, a wealth of uh, different example code. So along with the dev wiki, um, we also have a GitHub account. And on our GitHub account, um, we have a few complete examples um, and a whole bunch of reference code for working with specific hardware or web services. Um, so these are really good places to go for uh, looking at good code examples uh, and sort of searching around to figure out what your code should look like for what you're trying to do. Did you show the reference designs? Uh, no, that's a good point. Um, so one of the other things we have available um, is a fairly large uh, section of reference boards. So these are um, basically complete board layouts that you can use to accomplish uh, sort of specific things with the imp. Um, all of them are completely open. You can do anything you want with them, including uh, manufacturing and selling them. Um, so some of the, the really cool ones that a lot of people like 
um, are the NORA. So the NORA is a, a board with uh, a fairly complete set of sensors um, for environmental sensing. It's got temperature, humidity, barometric pressures, some accelerometers, um, light sensor, light, light sensor. Um, yeah, and then, and that one's actually designed as well. I mean, some of the things about these reference designs is an awful lot of embedded design uh, turns out to be power supply design. So actually, these have got some really, really good power supply examples. Like Nora has a really good example of a, a cheap, effective power supply that you can build, uh, which will run from two AA batteries, run a imp from two AA batteries, and that will you can with that you can power an imp for about two and a half years if it waits every 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. To say sample temperature or humidity and send it um, over over Wi-Fi uh, to a server. So um, you know there's there's various bits in there which you know we have full schematics. They're actually it's actually public domain. It's not even an open source license. It's just if you feel like cribbing a bit of this design for something else or a bit of the PCB layout, go ahead. That's fine by us. We'd like if you use an imp with it, but you know there's actually <laughs> not even a requirement for that. So if you wanna if you wanna have a you know a good layout for uh, for a TPS six two one two seven or you want a good layout for uh, the the XC nine zero I can't remember what it is the the one in the design the boost supply go ahead um, have a look in there uh, we provide the documentation there's Altium source files there's Gerber's there's pretty much everything yeah. you might need um, so there's some some good ideas in there and uh, you know these these designs came from us. Um, Pretty much, you know, we have lots of questions about a power supply and how to make a low power system and, you know, how I should run it off this type of power, whatever, uh, how I wire up this sensor. And, and so these reference designs are kind of the answer to that. So people can look at them, um, build them if they want, sell them if they fancy, anything they want to do with it. Um, but they're, they're basically designs that our in house apps team have built. Um, and they're, they're usually pretty useful. So. Okay, excellent. Um, doesn't look like we have uh, any more questions coming in right now, but we'll we'll tweet out the links that we talked about today. And uh, I guess for now, do, do you guys have anything else to add? Josh, I think it would be good if uh, Hugo, maybe you or Matt, you guys want to talk about basically you're talking about power consumption, uh, some of the the stuff that we've done as far as with polling, with basically going into low sleep uh, to basically optimize power and light. Yeah, so I mean, um, we have lots of uh, different sort of ex snippets of example code for different ways to optimize um, battery life. So one of the big things that we try to focus on is making sure that uh, your connected devices don't just suck up tons and tons of, of power, um, because a lot of times you want them in somewhat remote places and they won't necessarily be powered by um, you know, through AC power, DC power, it's going to be with batteries. So you want to make sure that, uh, you know, you have a really good power story. So we've done uh, lots of work to optimize power consumption when the imp goes into uh, deep or shallow sleeps, where it either can just basically um, completely shut itself down uh, and just sort of keep up a bare minimum so that it can wake up later, um, or go into a shallower sleep and be woken up by... Um, Wi-Fi signals, so if a message comes in, um, or if some event is triggered. So we've done, uh, yeah, we've done lots of work around sort of optimizing for that, and the Nora is a good example. Like, how long does the Nora last for? I think it pulls, what, every 15 minutes? Yeah, that's what we were saying. So if, yeah. if you pull about every 15 minutes and wake up and send data, it'll last for about two and a half years. Yeah, so, two AA batteries, right? Yeah, from, from two AA, and that's, that actually takes advantage of some of the things the imp will do um, the imp, when it's running Wi-Fi, needs like 2.7 volts to run the Wi-Fi PAs, but with Wi-Fi turned off, it can run at a lower voltage. So what it actually does from two AA is it will run directly off the cells when it's asleep, which means your real-time clock current and your RAM backup current is being taken at 1.8 volts. And then when it wants to fire up Wi-Fi, which can be under program control, so you can do some processing with Wi-Fi off and maybe collect an hour's worth of data every second or whatever you want, and then you can fire at Wi-Fi. And when you do that, the imp will turn on the external power supply, uh, which then, the, the thing about that, it means that you don't have the quiescent current of the power supply being drawn all the time. Uh, so you have this very flexible power strategy where you know, the voltage is, is dynamically changed depending on what the system needs to do. 
So there's some kind of cool things like that in our reference designs. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of the great things about having having these agents in the server side is even if the device is offline, uh, you know, the device is actually running off batteries, you can still access it via all your HTTP UI and talk to code you write, which runs in, in the Electric Imp cloud. So you can like uh, you can post a message to it, and then it's been picked up the next time the imp wakes up. So you can do a whole lot of really clever things like that. There are plenty of things where you want to open an app and maybe see the graph of temperature over the last 24 hours, even if the device is offline, because that can be buffered and spewed out by the by the agent code running in the tab, which is actually it's a fairly unique thing. You, it saves you from having to run your own server in, in many cases. I mean, some of the nice things about the electric imp on, in terms of that sort of thing. I mean, uh, uh, we, the story I always tell is, is at CES this year, I drove to Las Vegas, which is like a 500 mile drive, and 150 miles outside Las Vegas, I dropped a Nora reference design in a bush um, near a mall and hooked it up to the, the open Wi Fi. And I left it in this bush for like the, 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 pretty much the week we were at CES. And even though it was in a bush 150 miles away, I could still edit the code, fix bugs. I actually wrote the pressure sensor code for it. I've written the temperature sensor code before I dropped it in the bush. And I actually wrote the pressure sensor code uh, in the suite in Las Vegas on a device that was in a bush being powered by two AA batteries, um, which is kind of, it's kind of fun. Uh, it makes embedded programming a little different when you can, you, can, you can deploy something and then actually add features to it whenever. Um, so there's some, some kind of fun things you can do with it, which is very unique to the electric end, pretty much. Um, so, uh, so yeah, low power is good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I guess quickly before we wrap up, um, can you make a make a mention of where we can find the imp today? I see a couple examples on your desk there. Yeah. Um, so the. I can yeah, yeah. Why don't you talk about that one? Sure. So, like, this is the first uh, commercial product. This is the one you're referring to, I'm assuming, Josh. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, this is a uh, first commercial product. They actually launched it in Canada. The commercial came out during the uh, uh, Super Bowl. And basically, what it is, you order it from Budweiser. Uh, you basically receive it. You download the Budweiser app. You pick your favorite hockey team, and then real time, when your team scores, the light goes off. And I'll give you a little little taste of the sound. <laughs> So uh, basically, I mean, you can. What's awesome about this, if you look, you know, no, no keypads, no displays, uh, very intuitive. Each morning, it basically uh, checks for what games are going to be playing, and then it monitors for the the, the team that you selected, and it's going to uh, basically go off uh, real time. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty nifty, uh, clever application. Uh, the other one is actually an, uh, a device that uh, we hacked internally. Matt, I'll let you uh, give some uh, rundown on that one. Sure. Um, so that's a, a Brookstone Snack Man, it's called. Um, it's a IR candy machine. Um, so when you wave your hand under it, it'll dispense some candy. Um, and we decided that that wasn't uh, super interesting. Um, so instead, uh, we hooked it up to Twitter so that whenever somebody tweets at Electric Amp, it dispenses some M&Ms. Um, oh, it's and it's jelly beans, right? So it or like jelly beans. Okay. Um, so if people tweet that electric it. amp, it should, assuming it's running the right electric. code. There you go. <laughs> so this is bad in, in meetings; it just dispenses <laughs> constantly. Um, but but yeah, it's uh, it's it, it, it's it's kind of fun showing how you can connect a device. And you know, this is there's an instructor we're going to be published shortly about this. Yep. But pretty much it's an electric imp and April dev board, both of which are available from DigiKey, uh, and one transistor and a diode and a resistor. So uh, pre yeah, pretty much it. there's a, an agent part which, which deals with the web, web interface. The code on the device just gets told how many seconds to run the motor for, and it runs the motor for that many seconds and done. So it's uh, it's, a, it's it's quite a neat device. You could have it for anything. You know. One of the uh, one of the other cool things about this example is thank you, thank you Eden, Eden the cat. Um, <laughs> along along with uh, hooking it up to other web services, one of the cool things you can do with agents um, is actually host web pages out of them. Uh, so uh, what I've got up on my screen right now. Um, this, this URL is actually talking directly to the agent running in our cloud. Um, and instead of just returning a 200 OK message, it's actually returning uh, some HTML. 
So if we click on a button, um, it dispenses some candy for us. So this is, you know, this is a really easy way to make uh, mobile, sort of mobile, quick mobile apps without actually having to go through the process of, you know, developing full things. So. You want to talk about this one? I could do. I mean, this this is just another little <laughs> example. This is a, it's a, a pot in a box. It has a potentiometer hooked to an April dev board in a box, and this one actually is sending the resistance values to a light in the ceiling, which is another imp um, with the Quinn reference design on a dev board, which is a RGB RGB controller. So as I turn this, um, I can change the color of our conference. You may actually see it on the other one as well. But, so I can uh, I, I can change the color like this, and it just kind of gives an idea of the latency, which is actually pretty fast. Um, as I as I turn this, and if I turn this off, the light goes off. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's another example. The, the the one up in the ceiling is just basically three FETs hooked up to PWMs on the imp, so we can just PWM control the brightness of the RGB LEDs. And here, this is just an analog input fed into the the imp for sampling it so that's pretty much all, all that one is but it's a uh, it's a fun fun little device and just one I guess one thing I just we can show seeing as we have it here <laughs> people people are curious this is what the uh, the inside of the imp looks like um, there's actually some better pictures on the board but you can see there's two CSP packages uh, an antenna and this is a 0.35 millimeter thick PCB four layers with uh, you know laser drill and all this stuff, so it's a it's 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 quite nicely high integration. And the good thing about that is that that's kind of a pain to build that and do the RF testing on it. But you drop a module down and uh, and you get all the advantages of that on even a you know a single layer or, or two layer board. Hey John, did you mention cowbells by chance? That you wanted more cowbells. Cowbells, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we happen to have a. <laughs> you know, perhaps a cowbell. You got it set up. There you go. We got a cowbell hooked up to an amp. <laughs> in, case, in case anyone was looking for more cowbell, uh, we, we have that uh, on the end as well. Yeah. All right. So, so we can post that link, too? <laughs> Not that one. <laughs> so that might drive we, we We have the cowbell go off. When we get a new Twitter follower or a new Facebook, yeah. Follower on our page, the cowbell goes off. We did have it if anyone mentioned the word cowbell on Twitter, but it turns out people say cowbell a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. All right. Cool. Well, yeah, I'd just like to restate, you know, we're very excited at Digikey to uh, engage with Electric Imp, and we'll be uh, tweeting out those links, and, uh, and then we'll po be posting them to our website too. So, so those will be out there and look for them. Okay, I I I hope I, I don't know if there was a, we did have a bit of a glitch. It seems to be still that the, the link that was t tweeted by DigiKey still doesn't actually go to the live page. So uh, I think oh, people who okay. got on people who got on worked out if you take the end bit of the URL off, then it goes <laughs> to the live stream. Okay. So uh, all right. Anyway, cool. we we may get to do this again soon. <laughs> yeah, round two, which we wouldn't mind. So. So that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, that sounds good. So all right, with that, with that we'll end and, and thanks everybody. Okay, cool. Thanks, Sidiki. Thanks. Bye. All right, thank you guys. Bye.